try to look out and see what the project looks like from. All right, we're going <clears> to <throat> get started. So basically, I'd like to welcome you to the December 10th driver safety meeting. The uh, This is a requirement <clears throat> both from the standpoint of the Department of Transportation and the regulations, uh, the insurance company, and the need to basically keep you informed as drivers and uh, office personnel of the changes that are taking place in the industry with regulations or things that are being considered. The encouragement that I had from my wife this morning was, well, in the, in the words of Joe Madden, don't suck. So that's what the uh, premise of this presentation will be based on. We have some subjects to discuss that will affect, in the short and the long term, the industry and the drivers. The Road to Zero was formally proposed on 10-7. The 1031, the Seventh District Court of Appeals, had their formal uh, ruling on the ELD. Drug and Alcohol Clearinghouse was published on December 5th. The American Trucking Research Institute which is part of the ATA, put forward critical issues through their surveys. And as of Wednesday on the 7th, the speed limiter comment period ended. So a vision. Vision is what you have to have in any type of endeavor, whether it's part of a business or personal. And so biz vision for TU is very simple. The basic ABCs of transportation of goods are pick up on time, delivery on time, claim and accident free. Obviously, because of the fact that we're looking at a, <clears throat> this being a safety meeting for drivers, we're going to emphasize the claim and accident free, not that the other two aren't important. So you start out with a vision, you have a mission, you have goals, a strategy, and an action plan. These are all things and all steps that are necessary to accomplish this. The vision, we want to have claim-free delivery of cargo, accident-free delivery of cargo, and injury-free delivery of cargo for the driver and all parties involved. The mission, become a safer motor carrier because you can never assume that you're safe enough you always have to become safer so that whether it's on public or private roads, you can deliver a cargo without an accident or cargo damage and to accomplish this task without injury to any and all parties involved. The goal is to reduce the number of accidents, injury accidents to zero, property damage accidents to zero, Reduce the number of cargo claims, whether they're overhead hits, get fixed object, etc. Damage from securement, weather, uh, not tarping when you're supposed to tarp. Reduce the number of work comp and occupational accident claims with the drivers to zero. These are the accidents so far year to date. The biggest one that we have is hit by vehicle two. That's our most common thing is we are hit by vehicle two. The next most common thing is we hit a fixed object. The third most common thing is overhead. Now since we do what we do and we haul what we haul, this ties together with not only an accident but with a cargo claim. So you can see that from the other others that we have, they are well below the top three. From a claim standpoint, <clears throat> we have cargo, and then we have tractor and trailer damage. Those are the type of things that we have to reduce. Tractor trailer drivers. They account for every one out of six drivers that are killed on the work, and they're three times more likely to experience non-fatal injuries and illnesses. 
And this is from the Department of Labor. Strategy, reduce the CSA scores in all basics. Eliminate hours of service, not reduce, eliminate. Reduce the equipment violations. Increase our company's satisfaction with cargo condition at delivery. And reduce, eliminate injury risk for all people involved. Essentially, we want to eliminate and take down to zero that possibility. CSA basics, they all deal with things that take place. And they basically take place on the road. It's the driver's actions on the highways. It's not whether or not we have the paperwork correct in the office. It's your actions on the highway. Hours of service. Do you have your hours of service legal on the highway? You, the driver. Not whether or not we have the logs, even though it's important, whether we had paper or electronic, it's whether or not you out on the, on the road have this. Driver fitness is compliance. This is all paperwork. This is all, yeah, you're involved because as a driver, if you get a letter saying your state is going to do something because you didn't respond or you don't get the letter, then it affects you and us both. Controlled substance and alcohol. This is entirely the driver. Why? Because we have a zero tolerance. Zero tolerance for drug and alcohol. Impairment, effect on the driver, on the, doing the job at any point in time. Equipment, actions on the highway. Yes, we have a responsibility for equipment, but you have a responsibility as a driver to find those easy things. Hazmat, we are involved with that. Crash indicator, crash indicator is whether or not it's our fault or their fault. It doesn't make any difference. So, an accident takes place, it still counts against us no matter what. Unsafe driving, you can see from the track that unsafe driving is basically wavering well below the, the uh, point of 65 percentile, and we are at a point where we need to stay but continue to go down, because any type of moving violation affects us. The action plan, be a defensive driver at all times. You're better, you're bigger, you have to prove that day in and day out. Drive below the speed limit. Speed limits are suggestions for four-wheelers. From the standpoint of trucks, you should be well below that at all times. Keeping a proper following distance. This gives you the opportunity to react to those things that the four-wheelers, the situations that they put you into. So, defensive driving. This is a meaning that some might have, but it's not anything that we need to deal with. Unsafe driving, the action plan. Obey all posted signage unless directed otherwise by an officer. Reduce the distractions while driving. And then strive to become one of the knights of the highway. Now, you've heard the term of it. Where did it originate? It was a 1938 short film put out by Chevrolet, and it was actually called The Knights of the Highway. The wording here comes directly out of that thing. This was the attitude in 1938 through the 50s of professional truck drivers, because what did they have? They had high standards. They helped the public. The public image of truck drivers was very positive, very positive. And now, because of popular media, even though these are dated, Smokey and the Bandit and the Rubber Ducky are now the concepts that the public persona has of all truck drivers. And you may say, well, yeah, you know, I'm, I'm that badass, but guess what? 
this has comes at a cost. Ours is service. We basically are at the point where we still are below, but we need to track down, not continue tracking back up. Because with electronic logs, this should ha not happen at all. This should be a continual track down. So the action plan, have all trucks under electronic logs, operate all equipment within the hours of service regulations, and eliminate all hours of service violations, period. Driver fitness, compliance, we are at zero. Why? Because you have to have five events in a 24 month period to be scored. We are at three events, that's fine. I want it to be two events, then eventually one event, and then zero events. I want this to be continuing as a zero. We don't need this exposure for something that doesn't really point out any type of direction as far as identifying a high-risk driver or a high-risk carrier, because this doesn't do it. So keep the address on your driver's license current. If you're on the road, make sure somebody is opening your official looking mail. <clears throat> Notify us of any citations, letters concerning civil or criminal legislation, litigation, notification, because guess what? The first thing they're going to do is pull your license. And oh yeah, they're only going to do it by mail. They don't do it by email. They don't do it by text. They don't do it by Facebook. They only do it by snail mail because every state operates in that mode. We will continue to monitor the CDLs in the states that allow it. We can get we can get on our monitoring service. We can get updates if there's a status change, and sometimes if there's a violation. But there are certain states that do not participate. And if you happen to be in one of those states, we don't get anything. The political arena basically changes by the players, but it doesn't change by the emphasis. So the action plans: driving safely legal, driving defensively, giving you the opportunity to always be able to react to the dumb decisions of those around you. It can be as simple as goal, getting out and looking before you back, having your mirrors adjusted correctly, maintaining contact with your escorts, not trusting the on-site riggers for obstacle clearance, not being distracted while driving. You have to assume that every driver around you may be distracted, whether they're texting, have problems at work, home problems, daydreaming, software calculation of their route, drinking a hot or cold beverage, or having kids in the car. Whatever it is, there's mo their mind's not engaged with the current driving situation. And so you have to always assume that the driver around you is not paying attention. Because unfortunately, there's going to be a high percentage of time that that's going to be correct. Now, <clears throat> the road to zero, what is it? The road to zero, as proposed here, was actually put together by the National Highway Tra Traffic Safety Administration, the Federal Highway administration and the federal motor carrier safety to have zero fatalities in the next 30 years. Now, this was a formal thing that came out October 7th. 30 years from now, if I'm still alive, I'm probably not going to be worrying about whether there's zero fatalities. It's like whether this uh, auto robot is going to change my diaper in time or administer my liquid food intake. But the emphasis here is this is going to temper the regulation and the thing all the way through. Why? Because in 2015, we had an increase over 2014 of 7.2%. The number of deaths on the highway was 35,092. 
so far in 2016, it's projected to go up over 10%. Or, and that puts it about 38,600. Now, at one time, we were down close to almost 30,000 a year. It's going in the wrong direction. So the action plan, road to zero accidents, adjust your mirrors, see all the blind spots, check the mirrors, signal your intentions, run with your lights on. CSA provides a monthly measurement results on a rolling 24 month window. Older information drops off, newer information comes on. Lights on for safety. If you are moving, have your lights on, period. You have to have visibility. So, whether or not you're a company or owner operator, whether or not you're loaded or you're empty, always have your lights on if you're moving. Cargo claims, measure the dimensions of the load and weigh every load. Are loads properly secured? Is there such a thing as extra? If you have chains, binders, and straps, they don't do any good hanging up in the headache rack. Put them on the cargo. That's what they're there for. Well, the regulations say, well, yeah, okay, I want you to understand the number you have to have by regulation. But realistically, you should have an extra one for this person and that person and every other person in your life. Because having the minimum is not, will not save your life in this uh, industry. Having one extra for everyone who you care about will save your life. Protect the cargo from damage. Tarp every load unless instructed not to tarp every load in writing, verbally with your fleet manager. Not assumed because of rigor or someone unknown to you says, well, I wouldn't I wouldn't uh, tarp that. That's not authorization, folks. Something you never want your cargo to do. Cargo does not need to be set free. Cargo needs to be secured. Protect the cargo by selecting a safe parking spot. Review daily before driving your permits. Coordinate with the escorts. Stop and evaluate a situation. If you think there's a problem, stop and evaluate it. Don't say, hey, I think I can do this. And then you find out uh, that didn't quite work out so well. So cargo claims are measured in two ways, by number of claims and by dollar value. Typically, we don't have that many number of claims, but the dollar value can escalate rapidly with everything that we do. So measure the height, know the height, use a height stick, measure it from the ground to the highest point, measure it multiple points, know the trailer height and how much blocking you're going to use. After loading, check it before they detach. The time you spent will prevent a very costly cargo and or liability. Obviously, uh, there's going to be quite an issue here. Fortunately, this is not ours. Superload checklist has to be completed every day before starting, every day before you start the trip. Securement is paramount. 100 to one second. If there's a problem with securement and your cargo moves, it's all over. Read the permit, look at the map, plan your trip. Daily review of permit and the drivers in charge. You're the captain of the ship. The outriggers are those escorts. They do what you want them to do, how you want them to do it. Not follow me, you are in charge. Injury reduction. Don't have the accidents, but by definition accidents are unplanned events. You have to drive defensively. Also protect yourself with personal protective equipment. PPE can save your sight, save your hearing, save your fingers, 
which you might find useful at some point in time. The National Transportation Safety Board. They are a non-regulatory group. They've been in business for quite some time. They make suggestions. And as you can see up there on the left-hand side, for airlines, for trucks, for ships, for trains, and for pipelines. They investigate every type of major accident. Now, in every other industry that's represented in transportation, the NTSB says, we'd like to see this done. The airlines hop to, the rails hop to, the ship lines hop to, the pipelines hop to, the trucking industry says, yeah, okay, we'll think about it. So, it covers a lot of different areas. These areas that affect us are listed here. Collision, avoidance, alcohol, medical fitness, fatigue, distractions, the operator and recorder use. So, collision and avoidance. More and more, they're going to require in newer and newer vehicles to have automatic radar forward for stopping to the side. Who knows? It's all about making sure that they avoid through technology or better training or better possibilities for the driver to avoid collisions. Alcohol and drug impairment. Obviously, with a train accident of this, there's a problem. Alcohol and drugs, everybody says, well, yeah, illegal drugs, even legal drugs. Even now that the states, in many states, are approving medical marijuana or recreational marijuana, from a transportation standpoint, you can't participate. <coughs> but what's the most common drug? The legal drug, the one you can find down here at the corner, the one you can find at any stop you're at is alcohol. Alcohol cannot be used at any point, at any time, cannot be carried in the truck, cannot be part of a load unless it's part of a manifested load in a vehicle. There is zero tolerance for alcohol abuse. That's it. No leeway. I don't care if you can buy it at 10 different locations within 100 yards. You can't use it. You can't have it. You can't drink it, bathe in it, whatever you're going to do. Medical fitness. More and more, it's becoming medical fitness. That's why they're tightening down on sleep apnea. That's why they're tightening down on medical. That's why they're tightening down on the National Registry. That's why they're tightening down on blood pressure and diabetes. Fatigue. Fatigue takes place in all things. Whether you're a pilot, whether you're a train operator, whether you're a pipeline operator, oh yeah, whether you're a driver. Fatigue will affect your ability. And this is one of the things they're going to, they're emphasizing. Distractions, again, distractions kill. You either kill yourself or you kill others. Recorder use. Yep. Yeah. GPS. But how many of these major train accidents have you seen where they said, oh, well, we didn't have a recorder device on that engine. They have them in all the planes to a certain size. The small ones, they don't. But all the trucks, all the ships, they want to do every across the board. National Highway Traffic Safety Administration on 1123 came out with these things that they want to have restricted Displaying a video not related to driving, displaying graphical or photographic images, displaying automatically scrolling text, manual text, 
and displaying text from books, periodicals, social media. Anything that affects the distracted driving, they want to restrict it. The CDL Drug and Alcohol Clearinghouse. This was actually published on 12-5 this month. It fully goes into effect three years. It will be the central depository of all positive drug and alcohol. The employers, the third party administrators, the medical review officer will have to report the violation of this repository. The items test positive for drug and alcohol, refusal of drug and alcohol testing, undergo the return to duty for drug and alcohol rehabilitation programs. So when will it be checked? Motor carriers will be required to check it anytime there's a new applicant for a driving position. All existing drivers will have to be checked at least once a year. And then anytime you go in to get a new CDL, renew your CDL, or transfer between states, the states will check. And if you have a positive reported refusal or have not complied with the rehabilitation, you will not have a CDL. They will not issue a CDL. They will not renew a CDL. The substance abuse professionals are required to enter the information undergoing those in the return to work process. This can be anything from, I've seen it as short as two weeks to as long as five years. If you don't comply, you're not going to be part of it. Drivers, for us to check it, will have to give the written or electronic consent to check this. But if you do not give us this consent, we cannot use you as a driver. As of January 6th, 2023, the three-year point, the carriers will use this clearinghouse to do the three-year check of drug and alcohol checks. Currently, we are required to do this with previous employers. When this fully goes into effect, this requirement now transfers over to this clearinghouse. Personal protective equipment. Hard hat, safety glasses, gloves, steel toed, all these things you have to have and you have to wear. You should have these on when you get out at a consignee or a shipper. You, you step out of the truck without it on, it's too late. The top occupations, truck drivers are in this category primarily because of slips, trips, and falls. So the action plan, reduce trips, slips, and falls. Use three points of contact when climbing down from the tractor, the trailer, the equipment, or the cargo. Use proper lifting techniques. Do stretching of your muscles before going into heavy lifting. And use caution and take breaks in any type of weather, whether it's cold or it's hot. If you have a tarping that's going to be a challenge, Sometimes it's going to take time to do this to prevent an injury. So you always use three points of contact. OIDA. The OIDA lawsuit, there were five points in the lawsuit. <clears throat> they basically, the three judges rejected all five points. This was reported on Halloween, but it was not a trick. It was not a treat. It was just a realistic uh, decision. So the first point was the rule is contrary to law because it permits the LDs that are not entirely automatic. They basically told them you're just trying to muddy the waters here. You're trying to confuse the issue. That point's rejected. Agency used too narrow of definition and harassment that will not sufficiently protect drivers. Uh, you can read it, basically says, now nope, we got input from everybody and it's a reasonable expectation. 
The agency's cost-benefit analysis was inadequate and fails to justify it. Basically, the court said it wasn't a requirement because it was an act of Congress, but even if it was, the cost-benefit analysis was adequate. The agency didn't sufficiently con consider confidential protections. Uh, nope, they did. Number five. Mandate imposes, in effect, an unconstitutional search and seizure. That's Fourth Amendment. There is no Fourth Amendment. Basically, <clears throat> we are in a pervasively regulated industry, so we meet the requirement. So what's going to be the end result? OIDA said, well, we're going to appeal this, and we'll appeal it in the uh, Court of Appeals, 7th District, because there are multiple judges. There's about 12 judges, I think, in the district. It will go before all 12. If they turn that down, they're going to turn around and try to appeal it to the Supreme Court. Supreme Court gets about 2,000 cases presented to it a year. They only review 5%, or about 100. Uh, the likelihood of this being appealed and reviewed by the Supreme Court is zero. Critical issues in the trucking industry. This is from the American Trucking Research Institute, which is part of ATA. And if, as a result of their uh, survey, you can see the biggest thing that people are concerned about is electronic logging devices, followed by hours of service, followed by uh, cumulative impacts of regulations. So, driver shortage and driver retention are well down from the top three. So, yes, is there concern about implementing the ELDs? Obviously, there is. It's the biggest concern as being the most important in this whole survey. Now, we have a new president, a president-elect. What effect will that have? Well, the ship of state is very slow to move and very slow to change, okay? It's unlikely to have a drastic change, but then this year's been a little hard to predict just how things are going to go anyway. But you, <clears throat> if you want to consider some of these things that are just coming into effect right now, these have been around for a while. Some of these were proposed in the first Bush administration. Some were in the Clinton administration. Some were in the second Bush administration. And obviously some are now in the Obama administration. It takes literally years for some of these things to begin from the front to the back. And the other thing is safety on the highway is typically a nonpartisan issue. It didn't make any difference who was in charge of the House or the Senate. They basically would have voice count, you know, this needs to be done for highways. Oh, yeah, we'll agree on this. They couldn't agree what day it was, whether the sky was blue, but they could agree on this. And realistically, the House and Senate have been in the same party for the last few years. So any likelihood of drastic change in safety? The infrastructure uh, upgrade that's being proposed, we think it's bridges and interstates, but it could be a lot more than that. This construction season, if we enter into it, could be the FAST Act on steroids. And so the color of this could be orange. The orange barrel could be the new standard for highway movement. but. The Eisenhower interstate system was proposed in 1956. Basically, by the 1970s, it was completed. It's approaching 50 years old. Railroads, part of their rail system is a result of the Civil War era. Pipelines, which I know as I look around, some of you aren't old enough to know this, but in the 1950s, there were pipelines being put in everywhere. Well, guess what? They're 50, 60 years old. 
And how often now are we hearing about, well, this pipeline ruptured and all the gas going to the East Coast got disrupted. So infrastructure might include mass transit, internet systems, electrical transmission lines, water and sewer, coal-fired nuclear power plants, and just about anything else that you can think of. So highways, bridge repair, replacement may be the most important part from our standpoint, but it may not carry across. It's important. It'll be addressed. But the FAST Act was the first thing a year ago that dealt with this. It's the first multi-year funding plan for rebuilding the highway system or the infrastructure transportation system. From this, all the percentiles and alerts were taken off until the final review. At the earliest, the final review will be done February 4th, 2018. Uh, wouldn't think that's going to happen on time because the FMCSA doesn't do anything on time. I don't care who, who's in the administration. The absolute measures are the only thing that's put out there. And basically, <clears throat> people don't understand those. They really didn't understand CSA, but they knew it was the score between 1 and 100, and the lower you were, the better with these. But the percentiles and alert status are not there. Absolute measures are. Roadside inspections, out-of-service rates are still available. And the operating status, insurance status, and carrier safety rating is still available. Coercion, that was released last year, prevents from coercing drivers, Federal Motor Carrier Safety Regulations, basically includes the CDL, and the final rule is effective in the January of this year. But visibility demands. Shippers have long sought visibility to their freight. Today they're demanding it. So what's causing the move to GPS, to electronic logs, is it government regulations or is it customers? At this point, it's customers. So ELDs, they're here. Our current provider pedigree meets the requirements for 2017. And they will be fully ELD compliant by the end of this month. Now, you go way back to when Kennedy was president. Change. Change is something nobody likes. But change is, if you don't change, you don't have a future. So, <clears throat> class 7 and 8 trucks, exceptions, commercial motor vehicles older than model year 2000, and drive-away, tow-away operations. 100 mile radius, even though we require our 100 mile radius drivers to do, do the uh, logs. And then eight days, less than eight days in a 30 day period is an ongoing. Supporting documents, 13 days to get them in, whether they're bill lading schedules, itineraries. But do you have 13 days to get the bill lading in? We want you to have the bill of lading in as soon as you're done. Why? Because we have to bill it. You want to be paid for it. We can't bill it without you providing that. So 13 days is a misnomer. It's a regulation. That this is not dry, being driven by regulations. This is being driven by necessity. EOD locations, when driving, is only going to be accurate within one mile. And it'll pop in every 60 minutes while moving. And if you're on personal conveyance, it's only 10 miles every 60 minutes while moving. ELD information, they won't ask you to see your device. When it's fully compliant, it'll all be done by wireless web or Bluetooth, UBS. Limited edits, but we don't know how many. Daily log information, printed form, or on display. If you don't need, if you, you wish you didn't have to worry about ELD, 
there's something you have to be careful of. Be careful what you wish for. Auto. I'm sure you've seen some issues on auto. What is it? It's a semi-autonomous tractor that's being tested and with actual loads on U.S. highways at this point. Has limited abilities, only a level one, level two in the following chart. But this is what auto looks like. You have a video camera, you have front radar that goes between 800 and 300 feet, and then you had side, side uh, Lindar, which is uh, laser, to give indications. This is Otto on US 33 in Ohio, pulling a DOT, Ohio DOT tanker. It had two drivers in it. They had no input except to be there in a the safety manner. This was done completely autonomously. So where are we at? There are four levels, actually five levels of automation by definition. <clears throat> we are operating at zero at this point. Auto is operating between level one and level two, some aspects of both. Eventually, it will be level four. Now, will they be able to do this with oversized? Nah, that ain't gonna happen. But guess who you're gonna be out there in the highways with? You thought they were not nice when they wouldn't uh, respond on CVs or flash their lights when you're clear? There's not even gonna be a driver there. Canada. What's the issue with Canada? Well, we have a little issue with Canada and pedigree. Uh, they decided at a national level to change their phone system, not in its two years, turn it off, and this new one goes on. And pedigree went, what? <laughs> so you get into Canada, you have to print off the last seven days, and you have to transition the paper because pedigree won't work there right now. 34 hour restart, you've heard about it. That's gonna be Congress is gonna take care of this. Well, Congress is the one that screwed this up last year with the FAST Act. They put in a term saying, we're gonna make it permanent that you're not gonna have to worry about having two time frames between one and five to have a 34 hour restart. You can just be off a straight 34 hours. Problem was, it was so badly worded that they eliminated it. So for the last year, they basically gave everybody a King's X and said, okay, don't worry about it. We're still working under that premise, but we're gonna now address it in a continuing resolution to keep the government running. Well, the House passed it two days ago. The Senate, <laughs> Senate saying they're not going to pass it. So we're going to see what's happening because even if they did pass it, it's only a continuing resolution, which is runs out in March. Well, that's going to give us time to do this, big time. Uh, that's what they said in December of 2015, and they haven't been able to pass it then either. Highway and railroad crossing steps. You should have all seen this. You should all have it. Why is it important? This isn't ours, but it gives you the idea. So the basic steps. You have to do this review every day and look for specific railroad crossing instructions. Stop prior and evaluate the grade. I don't care if you've been across it before. If you're going across it with a specialized or super load, do it every time. Call the railroad. Look for the time window opening. When's next train coming? That was very that was the one step we did not do in May of 2015. <clears throat> we had a vehicle that got stuck on the railroad and the next, 
the train was going to be coming in 10 minutes. The next train was at impact was at 8.47, and from the time he was stuck until the time of impact was three minutes and one second. The next scheduled train was 2,300 hours. So if we'd known that, if we'd thought about it, <coughs> let's wait until the train goes by and then go across. And if we have a problem, we've got a big window. Override the air pressure, give us maximum clearance, two speed, put it in, engage power divider, and don't shift going over the railroad. Power through it. If you encounter a problem, call the railroad first, call 911 first, then call us. Because you got to make that phone call. These are where their numbers are, but the handout's got all the major hot, all the major uh, things. There is an app that you can download for railroad crossing information. It, if you call in and give, you give them the number, they know exactly where you're at. So, weight change, Ohio, one mile. In fact, they're so specific, it's 5,280 feet. So I'm sure the people in Ohio have spray painted a line 5,280 feet from an exit. You can't cross under a structure. If you're greater, permit height is greater than 13.6, or over a structure if 10 feet wide or bigger. Reentry is the same. You must be able to see it. And if you do any of those things, you're considered off route and subject to fine and penalty. Hair testing, drug use, no publication date. Insulin dependent, Medical Review Board has published as far as September 9th their recommendations. Now, diabetes can be treated by diet, can be treated by oral meds, and can be treated by injection. What they're proposing is not just diet and not just oral meds, but also injection. So they're going to be disqualified if they do not provide a diabetes assessment form from the treating physician. You have to complete ophthalmology, which is an eye exam, optometry, every two years. And then the physical is going to be issued that's going to be no longer than one year old, one year in length, and you have eight disqualifying factors. Hypoglycemia, last six months, blood sugar less than 60 milligrams per deciliter, hyperglycemia appears without warning, hypoglycemia with, with six months medically disqualified. Uncontrolled, A1C, it's greater than 10. You can't cheat on this one. A1C goes back over a 90-day time frame. So whether or not you're good in the last three days if you have your blood test, it doesn't make any difference. Stage three or four, permanently disqualified target organ damage, if it can be treated, and inadequate. In other words, if you don't do the blood test, every day and you have it on your little meter every day you don't provide it guess what you're done for at least 30 days disqualified not meeting previous qualifications and so you're disqualified for at least six months speed limiter it was published on September 7th the final comment period ended Wednesday, December 7th. What are, what's going to be the process here? There are three provided speeds, 60, 65, and 68. They're waiting for the comments. They did <clears throat> analysis. How many people, serious injuries, how many deaths, and how much money is it going to save at 60, at 65, and at 68? Non-compliance, oh yeah, they already have the fines figured out. Drivers, 2750, company, 11,000. So, they're looking and from 1999 Ford, 
cost of retrofitting if no ECU is available. Every vehicle at 26,000 or above will be involved. Speed limiter, if you have it, must be functionally maintained through the life of the vehicle. And there will be a three-year lead time for new manufacturers to become compliant. Speed would be set at the factory, however. Any existing vehicles that have the capability to do this electronically would have to be set. And the device would have to be the current and the two previous settings, speed settings with the data change. They are actually considering going back and looking at all existing class seven and eight trucks retrofitting. Naval bases, nuclear facilities, entry, US passport, passport card, TWIC and CDL, and original birth certificate. But if you have an active retired military ID, that suffices also. That's only at naval and nuclear facilities. National Registry. This is how you would log in if you want to find out if your physician or the place you need to get a physical direct is on the National Registry. As of Friday, there are 210 within 25 miles of us. You can check this by doing a search by city and state or by zip code. And it will give you a listing of those that are on the medical registry. So you can go up to 500 mile radius. If your medical examiner is not on the national registry, your physical is no good. It has to be done by someone on the registry. They are now merged together. Keep the long form physical and card with you. And every state requires submission of this. You know what your state does. You have to follow through with that. When it's fully implemented, the new physical will always be sent in by the medical examiner within 48 hours. But how important is this? The documentation that you have, you want to make sure you put it on file with your state of record. You have to, in order to be notified of this, you have to be kept your address current because the official letters of status will only come by US mail and will not be forwarded by the post office. And you may never know what happened to the uh, letter if it doesn't go to the right place. Now, <clears throat> sleep apnea. Obstructive sleep apnea is from the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration and the Federal Highway. Comment period has already ended as of June 8th of this year. Why is it important? For the obvious reasons that are listed here, but from the standpoint of the inability to safely respond to hazards, seems to be kind of important as far as drivers. The risk factors, if you're male, if you're overweight, you're old, you have a history of it, you have a large neck, you're pretty much screwed. It's gonna happen. It's associated with uh, some kind of important things, hypertension, diabetes. Now you're getting into the big stuff. Heart attack, stroke, sudden, sudden death. Sort of get your attention. So, CPAP, body mass index. If your body mass index is 40 or above, it's an automatic diagnosis. We don't have to know if you have any other symptoms. If it's 33 and above, then you have, you have any one of the symptoms. So what's gonna happen? They're gonna give you a 90 day physical as a driver, give you time to get it checked. If you don't, get, if you don't have the test done, guess what? You don't have a valid physical. If you don't have a valid physical, you don't have a CDL. And then it goes on a one year basis after that so they can check for compliance. So here it is. Pick out your height, pick out your weight. <clears throat> where's your body mass, where's your body mass index? 
Where do you fall? I'm not going to ask you. There are ways of increasing your height, but they're kind of extreme. Symptoms. Snoring. If somebody says, my God, your family member says, my God, it's like having a chainsaw in the house. People say you stop breathing when you're asleep. You abruptly wake with shortness of break. Great. Hey, Richard, what's up? Okay, I'm in the middle of the safety meeting. Is it important? Bye. Dunford. Abrupt wakings, waking up with dry mouth or sore throat, morning headache. Difficulty staying asleep, excessive sleepiness, attention problems, and irritability. And no, this was not a self-portrait. I have glasses on, you know, so. 30-minute uh, break, you have to have, under permit load, you have to have a copy of the letter with you. And so why? Because you're going to have to provide that proof to the inspector because they typically don't know if you're under exemption or not. So this is the... It's all the way till June 18th, 2020. If you're under permit load, you're exempted from 30-minute break. So make sure you have a copy of the letter. Indiana treats any permit violation as a civil fine of 1000 bucks, with or without a citation. And it can take anywhere from 5 to 12 months for that to show up. Permits, WCS has an application. You can download it. You can get all your provision sheets that are current. So <clears throat> you can put it on a, a smartphone, an Android, or an iPhone. <coughs> Load securement. A chain, a strap, and the headache crack doesn't do you any good. Put it on the cargo. It will save you problems and explanations. As of Friday, we've gone 250 days without a driver service inspection. We've gone 238 days without an out of service inspection in, the spe in uh, load securement. We've gone 198 days without an out-of-service inspection with equipment. So, in the month of November, we had eight inspections. All eight were clean. There were no violations. So, from the standpoint of drivers, I commend you on your job. As a standpoint of shop, I commend you on keeping the equipment up. That is, we've had, <clears throat> we've gone over six months without an out-of-service inspection. That's excellent. DOT reportable, 37 days. CSA, do not count on DOT inspections to find all the problems, even at the 90-day level. You have to do the pre-trip. The threshold on basic for uh, maintenance, we have to continue to have that tracked down. It, the unsafe or driving, we're at 60 thresholds at 65, we're at 25. Performance measure 2.20. These are the major things that have taken place in the last 24 months. The white is the number of events, in parentheses is number of points that it counts against us. Hours of service, threshold is 65. We're at 52.60. <clears throat> These are the events in the last 24 months with a point total. Fail to have EOBR instructions available. You have about one minute from the time 
he asked for it to the time you have to produce it. He went three minutes, and the guy wrote him up anyway. Safety fitness, driver fitness. We're at zero. We need to be, say, at zero. We've had three events. We want those to drop off and not have any more. Controlled substance, we've had one event. It is now dropped down to a score of 16. We don't want any more, ever. Vehicle maintenance, scores at 65, threshold of 80, 3.74. The major events, if you notice outlined in white, you'll see a trend here. Tires. Lights, lights, brakes, lights, brakes, lights, and tires, BLT. Securement. Hazmat will always be zero because we do not haul hazmat. Crash indicator, we're at 13 percentile <coughs> at 0.13. We have six crashes in the last 24 months. They're all towaways. Three of them are preventable. Three of them are non-preventable. Two of them, if we get through December without another one showing up, will drop off. Crash indicator. They're supposed to look at this, the fast bill required by December 4th. And what's today? Did they do it? Uh, no. So, <clears throat> safety fitness determination. The FAST Act complied, it, but DOT IG says, nah, not until we're done with that review thing. You know, that could be, you know, 2018, 2020, 2024, who knows. But proposed earlier this year for unfit with a threshold of 96 percentile. Comments were due, so far no results. Worst 4% would only affect 2,436 carriers. And they're not even gonna do that. So currently we're satisfactory, conditional, and unsat. 86% of the 435,000 carriers that are out there are currently unrated. We give points as for clean roadside inspections. All roadside inspections are scanned, mailed in to the office. Most states require that we sign them and send them back within 15 days from the date of occurrence. As of Friday, we've had 91 inspections in the calendar year 2016. 45 of those are clean, which is 49%. We've had nine out of services, broken down as shown. These are the inspections. You'll see off to the far right how, many, how long it's been since we've had an out of service. Trip sheets, bill lading, all these things, whether you scan it, everything has to have your information on it so we can attribute it to the right person. Accident reports, always stop. Set out your triangles, document, pictures, and then call me. Fatality, DOT reportable accidents. Fatality, injury treated away from the scene, any vehicle has to be towed. ISSD, the suggestion used by almost every state now from the feds, who to inspect and who not to. We are at 40. That is green. That means don't bother us, go pick on somebody else. Very good thing. Except if you have a bad one, then you don't have the good ones to force it out with. Overhead, <clears throat> those pesky telephone lines, bridge overpasses, traffic lights, and trees. Location, primarily on the highway, next in the intersection, Third is shipper and consignee. Surprisingly enough, the truck stop isn't one of the highest ones. 
ice and snow. It's all about snow, ice, blowing, limited visibilities, buses, kids on school, driving to school, being driven to school. They're not paying attention to you. Snow plows, they're going to be all types, whether they're city, county, or private. Some of them are going to be clearly marked, and some of them, yeah, not so much. Some of the states, this will give you a real confidence builder here. Some of the states uh, have their snow plow drivers or office workers who are volunteered. They don't have any experience. They just said, from now on, you're going to be running a snow plow. So <clears throat> that individual coming down the road at you may or may not know what the hell they're doing. Windshield need to be clean, taillights, headlights, kept clear of road grime, snow and ice. Keep your dashboard clear and uncluttered and your adjusted mirrors adjusted and clean. You have to have the snow and ice cleared off the equipment, whether it's low boys, whether it's the cargo, because <clears throat> more and more states are saying you have to have, and especially in the Northeast, something come piece of ice or snow comes flying off your vehicle, you're going to be ticketed. And you may have to carry tire chains, but if it's ever bad enough that you have to put them on, you shouldn't be driving. You should not be on the road. Road work. There's going to be patching and construction zones. There's going to be restricted. The temporary patching zones can just pop up anywhere. They can be at any time. And always around constructions, you have impatient drivers, the hot dog drivers, sometimes literally. Winter driving hazards always increase your following distance and decrease your speed. Time and distance is necessary to react to what they're doing around you and always have your lights on when the truck's moving, so the help and the visibility. Recruiting incentive for owner operators and company drivers. We currently give agents as long as they're not their own trucks. And we give points out to the uh, bringing on owner operator company drivers. Fuel, these are the places with, with the biggest fuel rebate. These are the places you want to get and use the fueling app. That takes place or concludes my portion. There's